Hello, it's Dan. Hi, welcome to another mentoring stream. I haven't been around uh, for a few weeks. Basically what happened was um, we assigned the second character uh, three weeks ago, the Merlin character, for the class that this is for through the Crimson Daggers forums. And uh, what happened was people didn't seem to have it done by the deadline, which... Um, you know, it, it was upsetting because I'd like to see people really start adhering to deadlines and really, you know, start having that mentality. But um, I understand that some of you are working, some of you are taking classes, you have jobs. So whatever for whatever reason, they didn't get done. They, they just weren't at a level yet where, you know, I felt like they were worth critting. I, I could tell you guys weren't done with them. I could tell that you didn't feel confident with them or finished with them. So I talked to some of you. Um, Gave you an extra week, and the results are here. Um, they're much better than they were last week, so I'm glad you guys didn't waste the week. Um, especially in the case of, uh, well, I'll get into that later. I'm going to talk about each one. There's some there's some good pros and cons for each one, but overall, um, these characters are way more successful than the first round with the Arthur character. So you're all moving in a really good direction. Um, there's some big things you got to watch out for that I'm going to talk about. But the next character, the Morgan, is going to be the hardest one for all of you. Um, I know it's going to be. And then after that, it should be a little bit easier. So think about the crits I've given you on the Arthur. Think about the crits I've given you on the Merlin. Think about the design stuff we've talked about, the process stuff we've talked about, the weaknesses you got to address, all that stuff. And really bring that into your process for the next one. You know what I mean? Like really try to address these things from the start. Because a big thing that's happening, and um, a common flaw with all three of you that I want to address right now, and I really want you to hammer this out on the next one, all of you are jumping to finish way too soon. Um, Milan, you reeled it back on the Merlin. I do want to address that. You did a whole bunch of preliminary sketches and stuff beforehand. And I think, you know, we talked about it on Skype. I think that... Um, you saw the difference in your work, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think you you realized that it, it made it a lot stronger than the Arthur. It um it didn't make you commit so much, and that's that's the word I want to talk about is this committal mentality. Um, when you start rendering a piece before you've explored the design and you start finishing it before you've even like figured it out, like when you when you jump into that fear of I need to finish this as fast as possible and you start rendering from the get-go, you're automatically working yourself into a position where if I give you a crit, you're not going to listen to it. And all of you have been guilty of that with the past two characters. Um, I know you're all working on it. But what happens is, because you start finishing it and devoting all this time into the idea of finishing it so early on, when a week goes by and I give you a crit that says, well, you polished it, but it looks like crap. You know, the design's not working. You have to, you know, go back to basics. None of you want to do it because you've already committed so much time to the piece. You've devoted all this time to the idea of rendering it and finishing it and beating it out. But it's like, then my crits don't matter because you end up doing stuff like this where you'll just add little doodads here and there to the character without fundamentally changing it. You know what I mean? Like you'll add little distractions from the problems, but you won't fundamentally restart the piece. You won't change it because... Once you've climbed halfway up the mountain, you don't want to go back to the bottom and then climb up again. You just figure, well, I'll go to the top the way it is. But it doesn't work. So for the next one, for all three of you, I want you to really work on the design without any rendering. And I'm going to make that mandatory because I have to start like really teaching with this mentoring thing. We've been talking about design. I've been showing you stuff. I've been doing panovers. But now I'm going to really ramp it up and I'm gonna try and force you to approach work a different way. So if you don't do this, I'm going to disqualify you and I'm not gonna crit your next piece. So what I want you to do is I want you to draw with no rendering a design for the next character before you do anything to it. You have to show me, we have to talk about it. We have to address the problems before you commit to finishing it. Because if we don't do that, you're going to hammer out this finished thing that has a bunch of flaws. And that's the thing that I do not want you to do. Okay? 
You have to draw the character with lines, no values, no shading, nothing. I don't care if you do it with a tablet. I don't care if you do it with a pencil. I don't care if you do it with a ballpoint pen. I don't care if you do it with a Sharpie. doesn't matter. But it has to be lines. That's it. No rendering until I approve it, until we talk about it. Because you're, you're jumping into the deep end before you've mastered the shallows, all three of you. And we have to address that if you want your work to improve. Now, that's a tough thing, and I know it sounds mean, but it's a, it's a huge symbol of your maturity as an artist if you can take that crit and run with it. If you can go, okay, well, you know what? I can see the merit in that, and I'm going to do it. Don't worry, you'll still have plenty of time to finish it. I don't mind giving you an extra week to finish these. I don't mind extending it to three weeks if it means that you learn more and the end result is better. So this week, I want you to design the Morgan character in line. I want you to do multiple sketches. I want you to have fun with it. But the design has to work as lines before you start shading it, before you start rendering it, before you start coloring it. You're not moving to the next step until you get that out of the way. Okay, so with that being said, um, I'm going to look at these, then I'm going to talk about the Morgan character, and then I'm going to go. So we already critted these in terms of a design sense. Um, you guys used some of the stuff I talked about. You ignored other things. That's the way it goes. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll talk, about, I'll talk about weaknesses first so we can end on a high note. If my voice is kind of shaky, it's freezing here. <laughs> I'm trying not to use my heat to save some money, but uh, yeah, it's a little uh, it's a little cold, so I'm a little shivery. But uh, okay, let's see here. All right, so I'm gonna start with Thomas. I usually start with Thomas, so I'll keep that going. We're looking at Thomas is in the middle, the Sage Urashima. Um, of the things I talked about last time, you used a few. You didn't use that many though. Um, that's okay. Basically, the the hard the harsh crit that I have to give again is that it looks like a very regular boring costume with some interesting things thrown on top of it. I'm not seeing an integrated design that runs through all the different elements. I'm seeing a guy wearing a very normal outfit but then he has these really cool gold plates and a really cool staff. If you took the plates and the staff away, it would just be a normal guy. So it's not, it's not fundamentally at its core a strong enough design to hold its own without the doodads. So it's like, you have, to, you have to start thinking about how can I make the cloth more than just cloth? How can I incorporate patterns? How can I incorporate a narrative? How can I do this? Um, the colors kind of surprised me. Um, I didn't really talk about this till now, but I'm going to address this now. This goes for uh, you and Tadis. Not so much on the current one, Tadis, but the last one. Um, one thing that I really want you to do with the next one, Thomas, and this is going to be tough for you, but I'm going to force you to do it. Um, because we're starting with lines, I do not want you to paint with grayscale. Because you're getting a very weird effect with your character where everything is warm and I know why everything is warm it's because since you started painting with gray you're fighting the cool colors as much as you can because gray is inherently a cool color we read it as a cool color so you're oversaturating all your stuff and what happens is like in the turtle shell colors don't gradiate this way in nature colors don't gradiate this way anywhere dark red isn't red mixed with black which is what happens when you just directly paint over grayscale stuff that's not, that doesn't work, that's not enough. Um, the defense I get when I talk about this approach is that lots of pros use it, stuff like that. Yeah, lots of pros do use it because they understand the necessary steps to making it work. Um, this is probably one out of three in terms of the steps you need to make a grayscale painting work. Um, you've laid the color in, that's step one. Step two is using like a soft light or a color dodge or a color layer with some, you know, um, complementary color or some cools in this case to really make the shapes look like they're turning and to add that extra color range into the piece um, that's not here especially in the turtle he's completely monochromatic I would you know he needs more blue in the shadows 
he needs more value range. He needs the light reflecting in a very specific way of the texture of what scales and shell look like. But right now, it looks like a terracotta turtle that somebody made out of that color clay and just baked it. There's no color range at all. So if you're going to make a grayscale painting work, the first step is to lay in the colors over your values. The second step is to then add complementary color, or the opposite, if it's mostly cool, add warms, if it's mostly warm, add cools. And the third step is to put a normal layer on top of the whole thing and directly paint in the things that the grayscale won't allow you to get. Because grayscale is inherently a limited palette form of painting. There's things you can not do when you start with a grayscale. So most artists that use it, artists like Westbird, other people like that, I know you're looking at Westbird, I can tell from your work. Um, they put a normal layer on top of what they do at the end, usually, not all the time, and they directly paint little things here and there that they can't get for whatever reason with the gray. So I don't, I don't want you to keep using grayscale because I think it's limiting your work, but I'll meet you halfway. If this is how you know how to paint and this is what you're only comfortable doing, you can paint in grayscale, but you have to get like this level of finish much sooner so I can then crit it and tell you how to use the other layer types on top of it to finish it. Because right now, this doesn't look done. It looks very, very monochromatic and it's way too warm. So I would recommend personally that you just do lines and then you paint with direct color because you'll learn way more about color doing it that way. But if you absolutely do not want to stop using grayscale, I can't force you to stop. Um, I recommend you stop. I think you'll learn a lot more. I used to paint in grayscale all the time. It's the only method I would use. When I stopped, I learned infinitely more about color and I actually started finding ways around my color blindness. So that's the thing. Like, trust me, I did grayscale for ages and I'm colorblind. And I thought that grayscale was the only way I was going to be able to paint because I thought it was the only way I could manipulate color in a way that would, you know, fix my palette. I thought I'd have more control so less mistakes would happen. When I stopped painting in grayscale, my work exploded. It was so much better, so much faster. Um, but again, if you're not comfortable doing that, and you want to keep painting it in grayscale, you can do that, but then you, you know, I want you to send it to me for paint overs. And then I'll send you back PSDs and hopefully you can learn how to use the other things to make the grayscale painting work better. Um, again, I'm not trying to be mean, I just, I hope you understand, especially with the turtle, that like, the colors are just completely monochromatic. It's just like, you know, here's this color, here's a darker version of the color, here's the darkest version of the color. Um, but yeah, so that's one big thing. Um, yeah, I'm not going to be doing a lot of paint over on here. I will do very quickly, um, if I do like a color dodge, I'm not going to be like, I already told you guys what I thought you should do with the designs last, well, two weeks ago because of the extension, but you know, if you didn't run with the design changes yet, you're not gonna. So I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk about them again. I've already. I've already done that. Whoops. I need. Uh, like a soft light or a color layer. Yeah, like a color layer would work good here. But. Yeah, that's the thing is that I just want you to understand that grayscale limits you in a pretty fundamental way right from the get-go. And as long as you can understand that, you can start working around it. But like, even even something as basic as this, just, just look at how much that adds to the forms. That subtle blue that I'm laying in in the shadows, like look at what that does for your light. You know what I mean? It's like suddenly the shadows actually read as shadows and they start receding. Just little things like that. Like if you can learn tricks like this to improve your, your flat color on the gray, you can make these paintings pop a lot more. So it's like, I'm just using a color layer with a really low opacity with a blue and I'm just going in and laying in a blue and like, you know, you can get as colorful as you want. You can get like PK Mike colorful. If you guys know PK Mike's work, Mike Azevedo, he's like, 
insanely colorful and it's awesome. That's like his his thing is how how fast and vibrant his work is. So like you can go that colorful if you want, you can go subtle if you want, but like you know, that took you just watched me do it. It took 5 seconds, but look at what it does for your turtle when I turn it on and off. It's like that's not even polished and it's shitty and fast, but it's like look at what it does. It's like suddenly the light's actually making sense. So if you'll agree to start learning how to do these things on top of your gray, I'll let you keep doing the gray. Um, but yeah, I mean, that comes in everywhere. There should be blue light in here. There should be blue light in the shadow of that ball. Like, look what that does just to the ball, even. It's like, it should be blue in here, under the brim of the hat. It's like, it's just a necessary thing you gotta do. Um... Last week I talked about the design of the character. I mentioned it before we started here. Basically, the design, it just feels like a normal guy with a couple things tacked on and the turtle is tacked on. If you took away the turtle and the random gold plates, it's like there's no integrated design. It's just a guy wearing a regular outfit. So, again, big improvement on this one over the Arthur in general. You're definitely, it's definitely better. It's definitely stronger. Um... Especially, I think, the finish, the design, as much as I think you could have pushed it farther, it doesn't feel as random as the Arthur did. It feels a bit more reined in and understood. So there are improvements. It's good. The values are really good. Um, I think it's a bit more creative than the Arthur was. I know the turtle is kind of the thing we talked about, like the turtle could easily become a cop-out. Um, I think you can push more the turtle. I think you can make the saddle a little more interesting, stuff like that, really incorporate the guy onto the turtle. But overall, uh, it, it's a big improvement from the Arthur, and I think you're you're starting to get a few things. Now I really want to push you in terms of the fundamental stuff that you're avoiding. I know we talked about this a lot this week on, um, on Skype, but it's like, you know, it's time to start, well, let me put it this way, it's time to stop only focusing on the idea of I need a finished piece in my portfolio. That's the thing. And it's time to start, you know, thinking about it in terms of I have to address my weaknesses, get out of my comfort zones, and actually improve the level of finished work. Because you can make something look finished, you know what I mean? But it's only at like a 4 out of 10. You can make five images that are all 4 out of 10, and they're all going to look 4 out of 10. They're going to be as finished as each other when they're next to one another. But the idea shouldn't be to make a complete set that looks like 4 out of 10. It should be to try and push each piece higher. So you get a 4, a 6, an 8, a 10. You know what I mean? So with the next one, I want you to really, this goes for everybody doing this, I want you to stop worrying so much about giving me a finished portfolio character design, and I really want you to focus on design, period. If it's sketchy, if it's nothing, as long as I can see that you're really addressing the weakness of being able to draw and design without the crutch of rendering and making something look finished for the sake of finished sick, it's like, that's what I want to see. Um, but yeah, so it is good. I know my crits tend to be overwhelmingly negative, or seemingly negative, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not trying to be. It is much better. You just gotta push some other stuff. Um, let's see. I'm gonna talk about Tadis next. Okay, Tadis. Um, a couple things. This is gonna be kind of a split crit. Um... There's two, there's two sides of the image in this, and they're both completely disconnected, so that's what I'm going to talk about. The first side is the fundamental side. It's the understanding anatomy and pose and body weight. That is completely broken. But your values and your colors are way better than they were last time. The values and the colors in this are really, really good. I can tell what you're going for. It's a little too bright in some places, a little too much white in the mix. But it's much better than the first one. And it's a big improvement. The colors are really rich. The reds aren't too red. You're reining everything in. Even with all these different fantastic colors from the ancient Egyptian palette, you're reining them in and making them make sense. You're running into a bit of the same problem Thomas was, where the shadows just look like the same color with black mixed into it. 
I want you to start doing what I just told Thomas to do. I want you to start playing with mixing colors into opposite colors. Like, if that orange gold belt is receding, put some blue in it. It's it's the opposite color, you know, it's it's a complement, but that's what's gonna make it read as a shadow. You know, like start start choosing like, okay, my light's gonna be kinda red, my shadows are gonna be kinda blue. Get like a range of temperature in the piece. Because, you know, as cool as this is, I didn't mean to use the word cool because it's the opposite. But as interesting as this design is, and as well thought as the values are, the whole thing feels really warm and punchy because there's no cool receding things like that, okay? So, cool versus warm, warm versus cool, light versus dark, dark versus light. Interesting image making, um, interesting image making is all about the, um, the battle of opposites. There's no interesting image you've ever seen that doesn't play off opposites in some way. Usually, the more they play off of, the better it is. So, areas of light versus dark is what we call, you know, contrast or levels. You need good levels in a piece. Um, warm versus cool, that's your color range that establishes distance. Warm colors ascend, cool colors recede. Um, it, it's all opposites, light versus dark, um, all that stuff. Big versus small. When you're making art, all of those opposite relationships come into play and you have to really think about all of them. So the colors and values are a big step up. I think it's missing that last step though. Again, I already said it about Thomas's stuff. I'm just going to repeat so it sinks in. Um, that last step of, well, last two steps of bringing in the complementary color into the shadow or a cool color if it's too warm doesn't always have to be the complement. In this case, with gold, blue works especially well, but, you know, it doesn't always have to be the complement, but you got to start thinking about bringing more color in when you have a piece that looks very kind of grayscaled. So, on your mask, on your arm, on your muscles, it very much looks like you have, like, you know, the base color, whether it's the gold or the skin color, and then for shadows, you've mixed down variances of black to get darker and darker to darkest. Um, when that's the case, you can't leave it like that. You have to use a layer on top of it. You can set it to color, soft light, um, even multiply works sometimes, even though that's usually too dark. And you got to get some other color in there because as light moves around to form, it can't just get darker. It has to also, if the light's warm, as it turns away, it has to get cooler. Um, that's what's going to make it look like it's actually falling on it. So the design's working a lot better in this one. I think you did a really good job with it. Um, you took almost all the crits I talked about last week, and that's really cool. You played with some of them. You improved on some of them. I really like how you did the crown on top of the mask. Um, I think the values in the belt, that thing hanging between his legs, I think that's still a little too tight, too much dark versus light there. It's just um, it's popping out like a sticker you've put on top of the character. There's too many lines in it or something, dark lines. It's, it's jumping forward and it's not really sitting uh, peacefully on the character. That needs a little bit of work. I feel like uh, his staff should be taller. Like, uh, let me see if I can do this real quick. Like, I feel like his staff being the same level as his head is a little distracting. It's a little boring. Um, so... Like, if you did like this, I think even that, just a, just a little higher than his head, so it's not sharing that kind of implied line, I think that would be a lot better. Um, it, just, it just feels too boxed in, if you know what I mean. I'll show you what I mean in a second. But, you know, if you did this, and you just had this staff coming up normally, I think this works a lot better. You could also have this thing come around the other side again. A little more turning. Um, but yeah, when you had it like this, I'll show you what the problem is. It's, uh, and again, bear with me. I'm going to try and show you this with a red. Your entire character, and this is something you should watch out for unless it's intended. Unless this, this is the intention of the piece. Like if you're doing a very stout, muscly character, you usually don't want your character falling into a square. Squares are very boring. Um, they don't really have a lot of dynamism. But your character is completely in a box. 
and nothing's breaking that box and that flattens things and it doesn't make interest in the piece. So we can see that box around the character even if you haven't drawn it. Our eye projects that there because we understand that his outline, his silhouette is inside this negative shape of the box. Even though we're not shown it, our eye feels it. We feel the sameness and we feel the mirrored image of the sides. So the second you break that, the second you go outside that line, it's like, oh, okay. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so I would break that. Um, you don't need that much. I mean, just that is probably enough to upset that, that square. But yeah, just always think about that. But yeah, it's, it's crazy how little tiny things like that can just save a piece. You know what I mean? Like, um, you can put hours and hours of work into something and it might come down to like how high you make a horn on the helmet or something like that. That's what's going to make or break it. So just look out for those little things. Um, so I've talked about the strengths and the weaknesses. Uh, the big weakness again is anatomy. So this is something we're going to address next week because as I've said, you are not eligible for a crit on the next character unless you start with lines and you get the lines approved before you start rendering it. So we're going to fix your anatomy directly from the get-go. And that's the big thing that I want to hammer home, okay? This image could have been the best image in your portfolio if you had fixed the anatomy before you started rendering it. But because you jumped into rendering without the planning and the design first, you didn't want to then fix the anatomy when I told you to because you had already done so much work. You dug yourself into such a hole that you didn't want to fill it back in and start over. So instead, you polished what you already had without making any big fundamental changes. That's something everybody does when they find themselves in a tight spot. I'm not ripping on you for it. I've done it in the past. Everybody's had that experience. We're recognizing it for what it is. We're moving on. With the next character, the anatomy has to be done before you start rendering it because there's no point in finishing a character like this if it's fundamentally broken. In the same way that there's no point in building a house if the foundation isn't solid, because it's just going to fall down, it's the same thing with characters. If that skeleton's not where it needs to be, don't start building on it. Don't finish it, because ultimately the best you can hope for is a really polished, broken image. That, that's the best it's ever going to be. If the anatomy's not there, it doesn't matter how well you render it, doesn't matter how cool the costume is, it's still gonna look awkward because that base thing is off. So that's the mentality I want you to start getting, all of you. Fix these fundamental things, because they're simple things to fix. Anatomy is very simple to fix if it's just a drawing. You can look at it, you can look at reference, you can have people do a paint over, and you can address it very early on. You can get it out of the way. But once you start rendering, once you start putting on the armor, once you start finishing and devoting time, that's when anatomy becomes something that's very hard to fix. That's when you're like, oh, I made his arms too long, but it's going to take a whole day for me to fix them because there's 85 layers on top of the drawing. You know, like, that's the problem people get into is they think fixing anatomy is a very hard problem, but it's only hard because you're jumping into the deep end before you go through the shallows. It's the same thing. Fix these problems early on, and you'll save yourself hours of time later on. Um, okay. So, weaknesses, anatomy, strengths, much better design than the first one, much better colors, much better values, whole lot of pop. Um, it's, it really is much better than the first one. I just want you to know that before I move on. Um, again, I know I have a tendency to sound negative in these crits. I'm not trying to be. Um, this is a big achievement compared to the first one. So, just change those few things in the next one. Really keep your eyes open for the flaws we've talked about. I think you're going to do a much stronger third piece. Um, let's see. So now we're going to talk about Milan's. Let's see. Hold on a second. Getting a sore throat. Okay, let's see. Okay, so Milan. Um, big big achievement for you. Um, this is leagues beyond your, your first piece. Um, you reined it in, you did what I asked you to do, which surprised me because most people don't, 
You know what I mean? Um, nine times out of ten, if you give somebody a really tough crit like stop rendering, go back to line art, they won't do it because they're just like, well, my process is my process, and the artistic pride bullshit sets in, and they don't do it. You did a bunch of drawings, um, all different ones, all different kinds, and then we decided which one was going to look the best together. You pushed it. Um, you did the flat colors underneath the lines, and then you blended the lines and the colors together in the final step. You did some adjustment layers on top. And um, even though this image has its flaws, which I'm going to talk about, I hope you can see that it's infinitely better than the Arthur was. Like, I, I hope you understand that this this process of thinking about the design first and not worrying so much about the rendering and the finishing from the get-go is really saving your work. It's making a better solution in the end. So, a couple things I want to mention here. Uh, okay, so I think I know what you were doing in the smoke, but I'm not entirely sure. I have a funny feeling that you were referencing ink plumes and water. Is that what you were looking at? Like when people drop ink into a glass of water and how it plumes out? Because the flow of the cloud is very much like a plume, and that works, but the value range is way too, um, way too contrasted, I guess would be the term I would use. It's, um, it's almost like it's this one blue, and then it's like a black. So it's like, it becomes the problem where there's too many lines in it, so the eye doesn't really, the eye gets really distracted. It ends up looking like a bunch of spaghetti. So I'm just going to do this real quick. I'm going to turn down the opacity on this brush to like 20. And I'm just going to start losing detail in areas of focus. So it's like, I'm just going to do this, lose detail, lose detail. Keep the flow, because I love the flow of it. But start, you know, when there's that many black lines on top of a flat color, the eye's competing in too many areas for where to look. It's the same problem you ran into with your Arthur, where it was just too detailed and it was too high contrast everywhere. Give the eyes somewhere to rest, you know what I mean? If there's going to be that many lines and patterns in the guy, then the clouds need to be simpler so you know that the guy's the focus and not the clouds. You need to understand that the most detailed, the most contrasted thing is where we're going to go. That's going to be the subject of the piece. Everything else in the piece has to serve that subject by falling in line behind it. Okay? But even though it's too busy on the smoke, look how easily you can fix it. You know what I mean? It's like it doesn't take a lot of time to fix that. You're jumping into it, just a brush, drop the opacity, and start, you know, bringing that blue on, and then you can take areas of that darker color and you can start making big forms you know what I mean look at how ink plumes in water and actually um, I know you said you didn't use a lot of reference but for example uh, hold on I'm just gonna go to Google ink plume and uh, you know it's like right off the bat the first the first image that comes up is pretty much exactly what you did just red Look at the values in this. There's not little tiny black lines everywhere. You know what I mean? It's like big areas that fade into other big areas. And then in some places, there's little details. So it's like, let's see. Yeah, look at this. This is really cool. I'm going to put this in the chat. Like, you could use this, and you could actually bring those greens into it, and it would look really cool. You know what I mean? I'm going to pull this on the screen. But that's what I'm seeing when I look at your smoke, is it's not really smoke. It's like an ink plume that's been dropped into water. And I think, honestly, that works better. I think that works a lot better than smoke. You know what I mean? That's like a really, that's like a really cool original idea for a genie is to use these ink plumes instead of smoke. So it's like, look at that. Use that image to finish it. You know what I mean? Like, um, look at how it blends. So it's these big, very flowing shapes with little wispy, bright outlines around them. And there's not tons of little black lines. 
You know, it's it's very much. It, it's not distracting. It's very harmonious. It flows a lot better when you get rid of those little distractions. But yeah, so. I mean, just look at. I haven't even done a lot and clicking it on and off. It's like it's already much less of an eyesore. And then, you know, you could start uh, losing some of the edge where the light's hitting it, so it's not so crisp. You could start thinking about what the background is actually supposed to be. Um, using this kind of cream background, I mean, I'm not going to fault you on it too much, but give it some context, you know what I mean? Don't just make it a color. <laughs> but yeah, so then, you know, I did that. Then on top, I can just grab, like, uh, color dodge. Let's try this. Try a color dodge. If it doesn't work, I'll use a color layer. But now I'm going to select this kind of yellow green. Keep my opacity down at, like, 20. Darken it up a bit. But it's like, then you can start subtly working in other colors to it if you want to. So it's not just blue. You can get some greens in there, kind of have the green swirl out of green into blue. You could have the shadows be green and the highlights be blue. You could do all kinds of things. But yeah, just little little tweaks like that are going to give it a lot more life and character than leaving it alone. You know what I mean? Yes, and uh, Thomas is right. That's why I'm faulting you on the, the background. That's why I mentioned it. Um, this is way too close to being a white background. And that offsets your values. So... I want to see it on a dark background. That is what I said in the beginning. I am going to stick to it. So I would change it. Um, I'm going to use a paint bucket here and see if it hopefully it doesn't crash Photoshop. Sometimes the paint bucket tool crashes my Photoshop. Not always, but sometimes. Oh, I gotta do the magic wand selector. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> this looks like total shit. Uh, it's funny. But yeah, okay, I'm just gonna quickly sketch in around the outline. All right, so look, your, your values are actually not that bad. Um, if you make it a dark background, your, your values are still working pretty well. So just, just switch it, you know what I mean? Just switch it up to a dark background because when things get... The, the reason why, I explained this in the beginning of the class. I'll, I'll briefly talk about it again right now just for anyone listening or to remind you in case you forgot. When the background is white, when it's, when it's too bright, it's, um, it, it offsets how the eye reads the values of the piece. Um, it skews everything into extremes because it's being compared to the brightest color you can have on the monitor, which is white. And even though you used a cream, it was extremely bright. So it, it had the same effect. Um, putting things on a dark background is a lot more soothing to the eye. It lets the eye relax. It lets the eye take in the gradual shifts of gray that are in the color. Um, the gradation between the lights and the darks is a lot more um, fluid. It's not so, I guess, jarring would be the word. When an image is just on stark white, it's very jarring to the eye. Um, so it's, it's a lot easier to see your flaws and to improve the piece when it's on a dark background. You can really see how the values are working. You can really understand how the transitions are and are not servicing the piece. So... Yeah, go back to a dark background. But anyway, so 
see the difference? I mean, I hope you understand what I just said about the dark background. Can you see it just from me clicking it on and off? How the super bright background is just distracting the eye. It's not letting us enjoy the character. Keep in mind that if you're doing an illustration, uh, there's plenty of times when using a light background is great. I'm not saying light backgrounds are always bad. In illustration, they serve their purpose depending on the context of the illustration. It's a lighting scenario that you have to understand how to use when you need to use it. But for concept art, um, you know, if you're doing like sketches and stuff like Wes Burt does a lot, you'll see a lineup of sketches and characters. That can go on white because it's not a full painting. Um, a lot of his paintings are on white, but the thing is is that he's painting them in such a way that the light around the character is the white of the page. So he'll reflect the white of the page into the armor and stuff like that, and it's a really cool way to do it where it works on white, but that's a little too beyond what I'm trying to teach you guys right now. So certain artists do it, and it works when they do it because they're using the white of the page as a tool. They're painting the character as if they were standing in a white room and the white light was reflecting into the color of the character. That's when it's harmonious. If you just paint a character and you make the background light because you think the character's dark and light and contrast, it doesn't always work. And you can get into this thing I just talked about where the eye gets very distracted. So um, for now, try to stick with dark backgrounds. Um, but yeah. So anyway... Uh, let me show you an example of what I was just talking about. So, yeah, here we go. Like, for, like this, for instance. Like, this is Wes Burt. This is some design work he did for a Lord of the Rings game. See what I mean is like, the reason it works on the white in this case is because number one, his values are all basically forcing the silhouette to read. That's number one. So things like the sleeve and the glove are so close to black in relative to the white that they work just as a shape. He doesn't need to render them out because the shape is so accurate that the eye puts it together for you. Things like the legs, the silhouette is so dead on that we don't need to see tons of details. You know what I mean? It's so accurate that the eye knows what it is. So then he gets up to where the eye is going to rest, which is the focus of the piece, which is the face, the shoulders. This, this is where the light's falling. So when you look at pieces like this that Wes does, you're almost never looking at the feet. And he's, he's making your eye do that. Artists that really know what they're doing when they're painting with value can force the eye to look where they want it to look. So if you were to open this up and look at it, you're looking at the face and the shoulders because that's where the most value range is. Things like the feet are basically just silhouettes. There's not a whole lot in there, but they're so accurate that the eye doesn't notice that. It feels like that's totally natural because it wants to look at the face. So he's reflecting the white of the page into the shoulders. He's reflecting it into this, um, this thing around the neck. You can see the white of the page reflected into the chainmail. The white of the page is reflecting onto the side of his face that's catching the light. The white of the page is even reflecting into the little um, highlights on the leather. They're not very bright because leather is not as shiny as metal, but that's not a warm color being reflected into them. That's white. It's a, it's a very grayscale value range, and it works. That's the, that's the only reason this is working on a white page, is because he's planning it to be in a white environment. Okay, So that's why. Just because if I say dark backgrounds are better, someone's going to call me out on it. Um, okay, so I've talked about, actually there's a couple more things. Uh, get some, um, I just want to talk about this real quick. Might have to use a color dodge. Um, your colors are still gray. This is, okay, so this character here, I'm going to zoom in. I love what you've done with the design. It's miles beyond the first character you did. So much better. But your colors are still a little too gray. Okay? Just a little too gray. And uh, things like gold, I really want you to start making them feel gold. You know what I mean? I really, I really want to start really feeling that. 
Um, so like, I'm just going to add little punches here and there. Little warm, bright punches. It's just, uh, it needs more temperature and it needs more value. That's really it. More, more color, more value. Color and temperature are kind of synonymous with what I'm talking about right now. The warm stuff needs to be warmer. The cool stuff needs to be cooler. Everything's still a little too much in the middle gray area. Um, again, way better than the first one. You're definitely going in the right direction. Just keep going in the right direction. Keep building on what you've done here. Stuff like this gold flute. I really want to feel like it's a, you know, it's like a gold flute. I want those gold speculars. I want that, that luster. I want to, I want to see that, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, it's like, even just that, I mean, that was nothing that took five seconds, but it's like, look how much it pops the gold, especially when he's mostly blue. It's the compliment. That's the thing you want to play off that. Um, other things I'd do uh, in the bottle, I would have brought some gold designs into the bottle. It's it's too blue. I feel like you could have done something like this, wrapping around it, uh, you know, like a like a band holding together those uh those kind of ribbed shapes going around it. They just feel a little too uninterrupted compared to the rest of the design of the character that you've done. So like. I would have put some gold banding on the bottle, um, something, just to add a second color to it. Maybe silver instead of gold, it's totally up to you, but it just needs another color. I hope you can see what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I feel like I feel like it needs another color in there. I'm just uh, scribbling. I'm not going to try and polish anything. I just want to show you what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so the other thing we talked about, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Um, you pretty much ran with every crit I gave you last time. And there's one that you started to do that I really liked that I'd like to see pushed a little farther. Um, we were talking about how you could give this character and how you could, instead of having man pasted on top of smoke, which was the problem you were having in the beginning last week. We wanted to integrate the two so it looked like the smoke was forming into the man. You started to do that. You have it wrapping around his flute. You have um, it turning into the patterns of his costume, but it's still not its still not enough. You know what I mean? So, like, there's a big empty area of blue right here, and, uh, you know, this design could have come down a bit farther into it, See what I'm talking about? This big empty area. This could have come down a bit and formed into the smoke here. Um, this could have come down on the other side. You know, I want it to be more more gradual. You want you want the smoke to gradiate into the costume. It's starting to work right here. It's especially sweet right here. This is getting towards what we were talking about, right in this area. But everywhere else, it's still very much, here's one thing, here's another thing. They're not really meshed together yet. So, you know, you had this uh, diamond pattern in here. I'm gonna just bring it in rudimentally, kinda. There's one. You know, just have it fade a bit more. Have more of a, a gradient. Show more of the character in the smoke and less of the smoke. You know what I mean? Because right now it's a lot of smoke for smoke's sake. More gradation of the character into it is going to make it a lot stronger. See what I mean? I 
I hope this is making sense. I never really know if I'm just rambling or if people are understanding what I'm saying. Maybe have it be a little transparent. You know what I mean? Like there's all kinds of cool stuff you could do. But anyway, I'll, I don't want to finish it for you. So, but yeah, like having more of the character fade into the smoke than there is right now is going to make the smoke a lot more of a, a cool thing. Like, just look at that. Look at that middle sash. Look what fading that into the smoke does for the piece right there. See that? Granted, it's not done and uh, it's not polished, but that smoke is way less of a, here's a blue shape in front of the character. And now it's more of a, oh, is that transparent? Is the smoke turning into him? You know, like what, you know, they're, they're interactive now. The two things are becoming one thing instead of a guy pasted on top of smoke. So harmonize the two. Really work on that. I think that's going to help you a lot. <clears throat> okay, so again, huge improvement. And again, I want to tell both of you guys, um, Thomas and Tadas, go back and look at Milan's Merlin, and then go back and look at Milan's Arthur. Compare the two. The only thing he did differently in this one is that he approached it from drawing and he made it look good as a drawing without any rendering first. And then the colors came naturally and he didn't have to force himself to work it to death. The only reason this is such an improvement over the last one is because he went back to the basic of I'm going to draw. The only reason I'm making you guys do it is because he did it and it worked. So now I'm going, okay, if it worked for Milan, it's going to work for you guys. Because that's what worked for me when I used to render things to death too. So I want you guys to have that same kind of success with the next one. The leap that he made from the Arthur to Merlin, I want both of you guys to make from the Merlin to the Morgan. Okay? So that being said, um, really good work all three of you. Uh, thank you for not wasting the extra week. And again, keep in mind, I just want to reiterate this before we get into Morgan. If you need an extra week, I will give you an extra week. So I want, I want you to learn, and I want the characters you do in this class to be portfolio ready when they're done. So we're going to do the next one as a drawing first. Only lines. And if that means I have to give you an extra week to finish it once the drawing's done, that's fine. That, that's much better than rushing it into two weeks just to have it be done. I don't care about it being done. I care about you learning something and having it be a, a step forward in your portfolio. Um, okay, so the next character is Morgan. All right, it's Morgan, and this is going to be the hardest one for all three of you because all of you don't do females. Um, it's a common thing when you're starting out to avoid female anatomy. Most people do. Um, because female anatomy is very much about flow and rhythm. It's a lot of soft shapes that meld into other soft shapes. So if you get anything wrong, the awkward things jump out a lot more than they do with guys because in concept art especially, females are supposed to be pretty. And that's a, that's a common thing. It's like, you know, if you're going to do a female as a concept artist, you got to know how to make her pretty. You got to know how to make her sexy. You got to know how to make her appealing. And if you're bad at female anatomy, all those things fall on the floor and do a thousand pieces instantly, okay? So, all of you are guys, and all of you now have to draw a woman. And you have to do it as a drawing, so you can't even use soft brush rendering to show me the curves of the body to try and trick me from not seeing the bad drawing. So, your mission this week is to draw with lines, again, emphasizing line art. The Morgan character in your given culture for the Arthur thing. So, who is Morgan? What are we doing? What's the character brief? We're going with the classic Morgan as the villain. We're not going with the kind of mists of Avalon. Morgan's a feminist. She's at Avalon, blah, blah, blah. We're going to go with the traditional because we need two enemies because we have two good guys. We've got Arthur and Merlin. We're going to do Morgan and Mordred. So, she's a bad guy. But it's a little more complicated than that. She is a power player. 
Her father was Arthur's father, and whereas Arthur was a bastard son, she is a true-born daughter. So the story with the two of them, if you guys don't know the mythology, um, what you have to keep in mind for the design is that she is Arthur's sister. So the design motifs you used in Arthur based on his father, the red dragon, things like that, all that heraldic stuff that you looked up before, you can use that again, or you can reinterpret it. But they come from the same house. She wants to unseat him so her son, Mordred, can become king. She sleeps with her brother through sorcery and witchcraft. She tricks him into sleeping with her, impregnates herself with her own nephew, and then has a son to dethrone the king. Okay? That's, that's the story. That's all you need to know about it. So what are the basic elements? She's a woman. She's from the same culture and house as the Arthur character. She has to be affiliated with some kind of magic, sorcery, or um, uh, spirituality, something like that. Um, she's kind of a flip of the Merlin, whereas the Arthur is a flip of the Mordred. So you've got two sets here. You've got the good and evil set, and then you've got the flips. So Arthur and Mordred are flips of each other. Merlin and Morgan are flips of each other. She's the female sorceress archetype. She's evil, whereas Merlin's the male and he's good. Arthur's the good knight hero archetype. Mordred's the evil knight archetype. So you just did your Merlin. Think about the stuff you learned doing that. Think about the things you looked up in your culture about mysticism, magic, stuff like that. Apply different aspects of that to the Morgan. You can do all kinds of stuff. I know Thomas was asking me earlier if he could make her a geisha. Um, I have no problem with you using geisha design to do the Morgan character, but keep in mind is that, like the turtle, the geisha thing is a distraction for the eye. It's you going, look at my geisha, instead of, is this Morgan the character from the Arthur myth in a different culture? She has to feel like an evil, very politically oriented, magical kind of character. Those are the important things. It's not, look at the mask I gave her, or like, look at the makeup she's wearing. So if you can use the geisha designs to reinforce the core idea of what the character is, then that's fine. But don't use it as a cop-out to go, here's my geisha drawing. I did it for this class. It's supposed to be a Morgan. I want people to look at it and go, that is an evil woman who has some kind of affiliation with mysticism or sorcery, and... She happens to be a geisha. The geisha has to be the afterthought. So how do you make her look evil? Facial expression, pose, color palette, the lighting is a really good way to do it. Under lighting is really spooky, stuff like that. Um, you could put her almost totally in shadow. That's another cool thing you could try to do. So really, really think about this one. Really think about how you're going to approach it when you're doing your drawings. But that's all secondary. The most important thing now, the only thing you guys should worry about, is the drawing. I will be here all week. I will be checking the forms every day. When you have a drawing or set of drawings for the Morgan character that you're happy with, tell me on Skype. I will look at them. I will crit them. I will get them back to you as fast as possible so you can start finishing them. But do not jump into rendering until we've talked about your lines. All the problems have to be solved in the line art before I'm going to let you start coloring it this time. The anatomy, the design, the read, all of that has to be done first. Because I think you guys are going to learn, as Milan started to learn this week, that you can spend a lot less time on a character design and get a lot more done if you go about it in terms of planning instead of finishing. It's the work smart, not hard approach, okay? You guys are working way too hard, just not in a smart way. If you applied this work ethic to something that you planned out in stages where you finish the necessary goals in each step, your portfolios are going to increase like you wouldn't even believe, almost overnight. It's a very hard switch to flip. I had a hard time doing it when I first tried, but once you start doing it, the difference is going to be night and day. So let's really work on doing that, okay? Uh, Tadis, you can get my Skype from uh, Milan or Thomas or PM me on the forums. I'm not going to give it to you here because there's 80 people here and a bunch of people are going to watch it on YouTube. And I don't want to get 400 Skype ads that I have to decline. 
So yeah, but uh, okay, that's um, that's basically it. Do you guys have any questions? Any questions at all before I go? I will answer them. Uh, Thomas says, "How much does your sexuality have to be involved in the concept?" As much as you want it to be. It's totally up to you. Um, the core things with Morgan that we're focusing on are that she's evil. She's politically tied to Arthur because she's the sister. And there's a connection to sorcery. Those are the only three required things. Um, if you want to make her look like a concubine or you want to make her really sexy, that's fine. You know, if you want to do that, that's totally okay with me. If you want to make her very stately... And you want to make her not so sexual, but very, like, powerful and, like, you know, just very, very statesman-like. Like, I'm going to rule, I'm going to conquer. That's fine. If you want to make her really mysterious, where you're not showing us barely any of her body, and she's got this crazy costume because she's a mystic or whatever, that's fine. Um, so it can be as sexual or asexual as you want it to be. Um, any other questions about it? Will you be critting the Morgon finals from those? Will you be critting the Morgon finals from those not of the selected three? Uh, yeah, I mean, I always talk about people's stuff. Um, I talked about some of the other Merlins last time. I've talked about the other Arthurs. I might talk about some other ones before I get off of here. Um, I don't do super in-depth crits for everybody that does it on the forum because tons of people are doing it. I just don't have time. But... Um, the stuff I'm saying to them, chances are, will apply to you. I know overwhelmingly the stuff I talked about today in terms of finishing versus planning, that applies to everybody on the forum. Every single one of you doing this, that's 100% the same problem you're all having. You're jumping into finishing the piece before you even make the drawing work, and it's turning into a huge house of cards. So, like, even though I'm not directly critting you when I do these videos, think, think about what I'm saying and try to understand if it applies to your work as well, because nine times out of ten it does. These are all problems that aren't specific to the three students I've taken on. They're problems that all beginners face. I'm still facing them, and I'm doing professional work now. They're, they're common problems that everybody faces in the industry. So if I'm critting Thomas on the problems of grayscale, and you're using grayscale, chances are you're making the same mistakes. If I'm critting Milan on his lines being too heavy and it's distracting the eye and you have a very linear style that's black and white, chances are you're having the same kind of eyesore issues where the eye doesn't know where to rest. If I'm critting Tadis and I'm saying the anatomy is totally off and even though the design's good it just looks wonky, chances are, I mean, all of you on the forum I can say without even looking because I, you know, I look at it all the time, no one's perfect at anatomy because it takes a long time. So, again... Even if I can't directly crit you on the video, chances are the stuff I'm saying to them applies to you. So please use it. Um, but yeah, let's see. About using the photo references I told you about the other day, should I use that approach, you know, due to the line art first stuff? You can use photo reference for line art. There's, there's implied lines in photos. You can still see shapes. I mean, if you have good photos you want to use for the Morgan, that's totally fine, but just... Don't jump into rendering. And show me the reference. If you're going to take photo reference, I want to see it. You know what I mean? I want to see what you're working into your piece. Because a lot of the time, as weird as this sounds, photo reference can actually be a problem. It can be a crutch and it can kill your creativity. It's super helpful sometimes, but sometimes it actually hurts you. And if that's the case, I want to be able to tell you and help you through it. Show you how to use reference the right way. Instead of just, I'm going to copy a photo draw some tribal tattoos on top of it and call it my own. That's what too many people do. Um, but yeah. So, I'm going to open the forums right here. I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, okay. So, I'm going to talk about some other people's stuff. Uh, this one's cool, but you've shot yourself in the foot um without getting too much into the design because you've sat him down on the ground and tilted his head at the ground and folded his legs we it's not a character design anymore i can't see enough of the character 
I couldn't give this to a 3D artist and say, make a render of this character. I don't know what his feet have on them. I don't know how tall he is. All it is is a mask and a guy sitting and you've worried way too much about the background and all that stuff and not enough about the character. This class is called, you know, character for portfolio. So next time, if you're going to do one, make him standing up. Show me the costume. I need to see everything on the costume. That's what this is about. Um, this one is kind of cool. I like this a lot. I'll scroll up and look at your first one. Uh, good changes on that. Uh, some of the stuff I talked about last time I still think applies. I think some of the armor is a little too square and a little too chunky. It looks kind of out of place, but it's much better than it was, so good job. I like this kind of weird Merlin. I think some of the bright colors you have in this should come into it, like especially the blues and stuff. Like uh, I like the leopard approach. That's cool, but it, it's too gray. It's too monochromatic. There's no life in the colors. It's all been kind of drained out of it. So add some vibrance, give him some turquoise beads or something, give him some feathers hanging from his arm. Whatever you gotta do, maybe make a, like a blue bounce light on the other side just to give his shadows like a cool blue color. Anything you can do to force some color in. Um, yeah, I think that would be cool. And again, same problem though, he's sitting. Um, if he's supposed to always be sitting, like Thomas found a way around it where his character was sitting, but he was sitting because his mode of transport isn't walking, it's a turtle. That becomes part of the character design because his Merlin's never going to be standing. He's always going to be on the turtle. So you could do that with this guy and make him riding something or you could put him on whatever. If you were doing an Arabian culture, you could give him a flying carpet, anything like that. If he's going to be sitting on a vehicle, that's one thing because we're never going to need to see his legs. But if this was concept art for a character and he's supposed to walk around, you're going to get called out on making him sit because the 3D team needs to see what he's wearing below the belt. They have to know what's down there because they can't make it up. So keep that in mind. Um, this one's cool. It's a little too plain. Um, it's the same problem we talked about uh, with the Arthur on almost everybody's. I can see, you know, it, it's a very tame costume. It's Here's this guy, he's kind of Eastern, and he's wearing a fur coat. And that's it. You know what I mean? It's it's too rooted in reality. That's when that's when using reality as a basis for your art becomes a problem, is when things become kind of mundane. So spice it up. Listen back to the previous streams I did creating the Arthurs and the Merlins, and um, all that stuff's going to apply to this. I don't need to repeat it because I've already talked about it on the class. But um, spice it up. Think about designs, think about motifs you can work into this, stuff like that. Um, let's see. Now, I don't know if you're working in grayscale or not, but your colors have to have punch. This is just way too dark. Uh, you can't see anything. It's so, so dark. Um, it's so gray. Everything's been grayed out. Same with the, uh, the Merlin. I understand what you're doing with the lighting here, making them very dark with the kind of foggy backlight like it's overcast. That's a cool thing, but it's only as cool as the colors allow it to be. When everything's kind of dark gray and desaturated, that falls flat on its face because it's like, it's not exciting for the, for the person looking at it. In terms of design, I think the silhouette works really well. I like the smoky dragon wrapping around them, but I think you need to work on it more. Um, I think it needs to look smokier and you need to show more cues that it's a dragon because it kind of looks like a soft serve ice cream cone wrapping around his body and then there's a random dragon head and it's like, what is that? Or it's like he's standing in a pile of dog shit and there's just a dragon head under his arm and it's like, okay. You need to show me that that's a dragon wrapping around him and that's its head coming out under its arm. Not random spiral shape with suddenly an extremely detailed dragon head. You need to take the design stuff you put in that head and bring it through the body. Um, and if he's made of smoke and that's your defense for that crit, then you need to have it be more detailed at the top and gradually get less detailed as it spirals down. Um, for the Merlin, it's a little too plain. The same with the Arthur. It's a, it's very much accurate for the culture, but you're not adding that spice. You know what I mean? You're following the recipe to get the culture right, but you're not adding that punch at the end that makes it your own, that makes it very visually exciting. 
Um, I want to see, you know, if you're going to be using mostly cloth on your Merlin, show me some designs on the cloth. Stitch something into it. Give him some armor under it with something engraved in it. Make the cloth billowing out around him in the negative shape of something. Like uh, a very common thing people do is like the cable billow out and turn into wings or something like that. Anything you can do to make it not just a guy. That's the thing you got to think about. And uh, as always, don't make the eyes glowing. It's a cop-out. Um, it works a little better here than it did in Thomas's, simply because Thomas had the Raiden hat. And if you have a Raiden hat and glowing eyes, instantly it's Raiden. Um, but still, having a big, soft, round brush of glow around the eye just looks silly. It looks like car headlights in a foggy night. Um, it's much better to just have little tiny glowing pupils or just a glowing eyeball with no haze around it. Um, that's a lot spookier than making these big kind of fog lights in the head. Um, let's see, talked about that. This one from P. Tim. I'm not going to talk about your first one. Uh, I will talk about this one though. Um, I know you redid it and uh, it was definitely for the best. This design is actually almost, almost what I would call done. There's a couple things I want to crit. I'm going to pull it into preview so I can blow it up. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is a really good design. Um, your other one was running into a problem. This one doesn't run into it so much. Your other one was looking very much like the Dickens character of the Ghost of Christmas Present. It was a little, the, the beard being brown with this kind of coat, with the kind of chubbiness, it was like very much that character. It's not so much in this one. It's starting to work. Um, I really like the, uh, I like the, uh, well, I guess I'll talk about weaknesses first so I can end on a high note. Um, the weaknesses here, the legs are way too wide. Think about the body underneath that. What's he doing? You know what I mean? It's like, why are his legs spread so wide for no reason? Um, his feet could be closer together and the cape could still billow out. You know, the robe could still billow out in a triangle and his feet don't need to be four feet apart. You know what I mean? That could just be how it falls, um, like a pope rope or something. But yeah, bringing his legs closer together will make him look less like a cartoon character or like an action figure. Um... The glow on this ball is, uh, I, I can't tell what you're trying to do. It's like, is the ball glowing? In which case, if it's emitting light, it's not going to have a shadow because it's going to be glowing like a light bulb. Light bulbs don't have shadows. Um, if the light's just bouncing off it and making a glow, then why is it a big soft round brush around it? it the, there's no way it would be that bright. It just kind of... It kind of reads of like, you know, I took a soft round brush and made a glow because it's magical, whatever. It, it's too, it's too not thought out. That's the thing. Just adding a soft round glow to something doesn't make it magical. You have to, you have to plan it out. Um, if that is going to emit light, which is what I think you should do with it, by the way. I think you should make it a little tiny lantern that's built into the staff with like a candle inside it or something. Or just a glowing ball. You don't need to explain why it's lit up. That would be the way to do it. And I think that would be really cool. And based on the light you've given him, I'm assuming that that is a light source. So now I want to know, you know, why you put a shadow on it. There shouldn't be a shadow on the ball if it's glowing. Um, probably the weirdest thing in this piece is the white on white of the beard and the collar of the coat. Um, here's, here's one, there's two reasons why it's weird. One is that it's white on white and you've used the same texture for the beard as you have for the collar of the coat. So it's indistinguishable where the beard ends and the collar begins. The second reason is that the white of that collar doesn't come back in the coat design anywhere. The fur on the coat is all brown. So you would think that the fur on the collar of the coat would also be brown because people designing coats don't randomly throw in a new color for one part of the coat. So instantly my, my crit would be either make it a collar with designs in it and no fur like the rest of the coat or just make it a brown fur collar and let the beard be white because it doesn't, it's not working. So yeah, that, that's, that's the big thing. That's the biggest thing in the piece that you need to change. Um, 
little things that I would do if this was mine. Um, one thing I would do, uh, I would definitely change this to brown fur. And then in the hat, I would probably put a metal plate. Um, and I would carve whatever your design motif is going to be into it. I would either repeat the shapes that are in the robe where I would use the bear idea and I would carve the bear into it in like a gold plate. Has to be gold because you don't have any silver anywhere on the character. So you don't introduce a new color. Um, work with the ones that you've established in your palette. But I would probably add a round metal plate sewn into the hat that had some kind of that. Maybe some studs around the base of it. Little gold studs or something. It just feels like uh, you've got metal here, you've got metal here, and I want it to triangulate. These little gold things here and this gold thing here. It feels like there should be a third gold thing to balance out the piece. And the hat also feels a little too plain. It's too much of a real hat that they would wear. It doesn't have the necessary character to be, you know, this is my Merlin guy wearing a hat that a Merlin would wear. So I think adding a gold plate onto it with some carving would, would give it the necessary character it would need and it would balance out the gold. Um, this very Harry Potter, uh, expecto Patronum animal is, uh, it's cool. It's a little too polished. It's a little too, like, I spent four hours on the, on the smoky character. Um, I think it's supposed to be a bear. If it's a tiger, it's reading as a bear. Um, it's reading as a bear because of the roundness of the face. And because of the way the jaw opens up, the jaw is not deep. It's a very shallow, round, ovular jaw. Um, but yeah, I think it's supposed to be a bear. But uh, yeah, it's very much a Harry Potter spell. That's all anyone's going to see when they're looking at it. But uh, I would make it less rendered, I guess would be the way to put it. Uh, less little tiny white lines and more of like... A cloud you know what I mean like uh, like again you could look at ink plumes or you could look at smoke but right now it's it's very much um, it's more rendered than even his face is right now so it becomes something the eye goes to immediately um, but yeah 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 but really good design um, those were all my crits for it, but I really like the design. I really like the patterns. It works exceptionally well for the culture. Um, I like all the little nods. I love the idea of a glowing staff. Uh, again, the ball shouldn't have a shadow. That's a big problem. But putting a little lantern inside the staff is a really cool idea. And uh, you've lit it very well, too. You have the snowy ground, the dark background. We know he's in a wintry place just from those little two things. And then you've given a light source in the character. The character design has its own light source within it, so that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, cool stuff. Um, talked about those. This is supposed to be... Okay, yeah, this is the Merlin, just making sure. Um, this is the same problem you ran into last time, and I'm, I'm seeing a pattern in your work. Um, the arms are breaking it a little bit, but it's still in the completely rectangular shape. It's like everything from his legs all the way up to the headdress and back down is inside of like a Tootsie Roll shape. It's like he's a fruit roll-up of a character. It's just weird. It's, everything's in this very narrow, narrow space. It's just strange. It's like he's a book on a shelf slid between two other books. Um... I think maybe just force yourself to really work with silhouettes. Really look at the outline of the stuff you're doing from now on. The design, I think, works pretty well. Um, I like the headdress. I like the bare heads. That's really cool. Um, you've made it unreal enough that it doesn't feel boring. Um, I think you could have pushed it farther. I think there's a couple little random things. Like, I don't really get the face paint. It looks kind of like... I'm a psycho for psycho's sake, like the, you know, the teeth and the big, you know, it just looks really random. It doesn't really feel like a Merlin character. It feels like a cool, evil, twisted shaman or something that I would see, like, Brom paint. And I love Brom, but it's like, that's, that's not the character you're illustrating. Um, it's much better than the first one you did, definitely. Uh, it has the same problem where everything's too narrow, but again, in terms of design... It's like, 
it's not a Merlin character. It feels evil or something. So I would fix that. Um... Let's see. This one, this is an Arthur. I'm not going to talk about Arthurs. I already talked about Arthurs. Uh, real quick with this Arthur. I like the design a lot. If it was on a body that had anatomy that worked, I think this design would actually be extremely exciting. The colors are a little too gray. The blue should be vibrant. The red should be vibrant. The gold should feel gold. But again, you've rendered out a nice design on a completely broken body. Um, the head is completely skewed. It's totally fucked up. Um, just take a photo of yourself in that angle and use that as a basis to see the problems. But it's like, you've done a good design. I like it a lot. It works exceptionally well for Arthur in that culture. Really, really well. Like, I would really love to see this push to finish. But you have to make the anatomy work first. That's the thing. If the anatomy's not working, and you've got like little tiny hands and fat arms and very, you know, he's got no spine and his body's kind of lolling backwards in a very fly-swatted face, don't render it. Fix the anatomy first and then render it. You owe it to yourself. Because I can tell just from looking at this, you have a really good design sensibility. And it's a shame to waste that by not taking the anatomy seriously. So really focus on that because it's really good. Well, KTP in the chat, they are archetypes and they are in every culture. But, yeah, you have to stop. That, that, was, that was the challenge of this class is thinking about the Arthur characters from the Arthur legend in another culture because they're so rooted in Gaelic mythology and English culture that, you know, that, that's the challenge. Is They are an archetype, which means that they work on a universal level. So how do you take that character and retranslate it? It is doable. It's 100% doable. Some people in this class are already doing it. Let's see. I think the nose has to go. Looking at this one. I'm going to pull this into preview. I know what you're doing with the nose. I know that it's based in a thing. It's too goofy though. It's um just just because it's rooted in something doesn't mean it's a good design decision. Um I would kill the nose. It's it's too silly. I think this would be a pretty good design if he just had a regular guy nose. Um I like the idea. I'm assuming I I don't know if I'm getting this wrong. I think you're linking him with like a like a firework kind of thing. Like he understands how to use incendiary materials. So you're going for the Merlin as scientist idea, which no one else really did, which is kind of cool. So it's magical, but he's also got the technological aspect, which was another side of Merlin you could have used. Not a lot of people picked up on that one. But, um, you know, like he understands how to combine certain materials. I think that's kind of a cool thing. Um, if that's not what you're going for, I, I thought that's the I thought these were supposed to be little like f explosive canisters or something. Um, I like the design. I like the shoulder you've done. The shoulder is something I would have liked to see repeated elsewhere in the design because you're running into this problem where it's the random thing. You've shown me this very detailed carved thing in one place and it doesn't come back anywhere else, so it looks tacked on. If he had another very carved, detailed thing somewhere else, it would be like, oh, okay, you know, it's like a design aesthetic. He could have, like, a plate with something carved on it hanging in front of the groin, like a groin protector. Every culture's warriors at one point had those. That's something that's universally accessible when you're doing a design like this. He could have had something over his heart protecting it from arrows. He could have had something on a headdress. He could have had some kind of gauntlet. Um, but because it's just there in that one spot, I'm just kind of like, it's just random. It's it's unfortunate because that's my favorite part of the design. And it's only in that one spot. So I'd want to bring that back. Um, but yeah, it's good otherwise. I would get rid of the nose. I would add a little more character to the hair. The hair looks very weird and unnatural. I would get, make it more wavy and wispy and not just like straight hair coming out. 
But uh, yeah, this is cool. And make the fire work brighter. Make it work as a light source. If this is supposed to be like this bird made of light, really make it read as it's made of light. You know what I mean? No, like I get, I get what it is. I get the bird theme, but this, the way that this shoulder is rendered, the Tengu thing, like I get that. The way this is rendered doesn't come back anywhere else. It's not that the bird theme isn't repeated in other places. It's that this carved wood style rendering is only on the shoulder. It's like everything else is either cloth or it's banded metal. Even this, this is rendered as banded metal, cloth, 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 banded metal. And then it's like super detailed carved wood. I want that to come back in another place, possibly two other places. It's just, uh, it's how it's rendered, not the theme. It's just, I want that carved look somewhere else. Um, and you could have curled the eyebrows up to resemble wings. Wing dot, wing eyebrows, curving up. That would have looked a lot better than curved down. Um, this is cool. I like the silhouettes a lot. This is a really cool way to approach character design. I'm not going to talk a lot about this one. I think the design's working pretty well. Uh, things that don't work for me, this, this plate hanging here, this doesn't work for me. It's too random. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like anything I've seen in that culture. It's just very, it's just lines for the sake of lines. It needs a theme. Um, but I like the silhouette a lot, and I like the way the costumes light out a lot. And all these are great. Um, but yeah, just the little things like the etchings. If you're going to be working with wrought metal, make it really, you know, look at the culture, look at what they made, and actually, like, you know, try to replicate that feel. Um, well, I mean, like, okay, seeing in the chat, they said maybe make, like, you could make a shorter nose that was still a long nose, and you could curve it down and make it like a witch nose, and that would read more as like a bird's beak. But right now, it's like he just has a hot dog, hot dog sticking out of his face, like, whoop, like a red phallic Pinocchio knows. It's like, no. He doesn't need a Nathan's famous hot dog sticking out of his face. He needs either a curved cronish nose that's very bird-like and beakish, or he just needs a regular man nose. Um, yeah. This was the Christmas past one I talked about before. Looks just like him. Uh, talked about it, talked about it. This one, talked about this one last time. Finish it. All the crits I gave them today apply to this piece. From the grayscale to the colors to the um, areas of focus versus areas of emptiness. All of that applies to this, so listen to it and bring it to a higher level of finish. Um, well, what do you know? I think that's everybody. So I'm going to go. Um, really good stuff. Really looking forward to all of you guys busting your asses this week to not only do a female, but to do it as a line drawing. Wow. That's going to be tough. I can't wait to see you guys do that. I think it's going to help a lot, and I can't wait to crit your stuff. Uh, when you're done, message me on Skype when you have stuff you want me to look at, and I will definitely look at it and crit you, and uh, put it on the forums too, so I'll be checking every day in the morning. And uh, really good stuff. I'll put this on YouTube and put it in the forums as soon as I can. And uh, yeah, have a good night, guys. Good work. And again, don't focus on finishing. Focus on improving and learning and making the best character you've ever done. The next character, the Morgan, should be the best character in your portfolio. That's the goal. So don't focus on finishing. If it has to take three weeks, we'll do an extra week. Just make sure that you're focusing on learning and improving this time and not, oh, I got to get it done so I can show it. You know, like, don't worry about that. I want you to learn. I don't want you to just do. 
Have a good night.